Hello, this is Sean Flowers, the director of NetSuite Enterprise Services here at GSI. And we are gathered today to quickly review the NetSuite uh, outsource manufacturing feature that was released in the 2020.1 uh, release uh, that just came out of NetSuite. Uh, and so this is a new feature and we're just gonna review uh, who might wanna use it and what you can get out of it uh, if you decide to take advantage of it. Uh, so we'll high level go through the uh, way the feature works. Uh, we'll jump into the system and, and show you what it looks like in, in a live uh, NetSuite environment uh, and answer uh, any questions or concerns or comments you may have. Um, so for the feature intro, um, NetSuite has created this functionality specifically to target uh, companies that, manu that manage contract manufacturers uh, who create their products um, and ideally or you know uh, if it's part of your use case it makes it stronger if you manage inventories component inventories or sub assemblies uh, at that manufacturer's location um, this gives you a transactional setup that uh, has some automation features embedded in it and um, also provides you the uh, appropriate way to manage your costs etc uh, and, and, and so that's really the, the target of this. Um, so if you are uh, somebody who's manufacturing contract manufacturers, uh, especially if you have any of those conditions that I've listed at the bottom of the screen here, um, if you your contract manufacturers itemizes uh, conversion costs. So you know on a per unit uh, or per order basis uh, what you're paying the contract manufacturer simply to convert the materials. Um, if you have multiple contract manufacturers that provide you the same assemblies um, and you want to do comparisons on their performance or your cost basis and that type of thing, um, this will provide you a good way to, to achieve that. Um, certainly if you plan component inventory at your contract manufacturer, this should assist with the diminishment of your transactional manual management requirements. Um, if you utilize external demand and supply management tools, um, this is especially um, important. Um, natively, NetSuite's demand and supply management in the supply chain management um, bundle um, and, and generally, natively, um, you're not going to get purchase orders for outsource manufacturing systematically generated unless your tool set has been um, configured or customized to achieve that. So especially if you use external demand and supply management tools, for instance, a demand caster, um, this is a uh, potentially a great solution for you uh, because with a slight customization, you can take advantage of it. Um, and uh, if your planning department has um, individuals that manage uh, contract manufacturer accounts, so if you've got um, folks who uh, are responsible for the on-hand inventory at a contract manufacturer's location or, or any of that, that type of thing, if you've got folks that are responsible, um, this is a helpful transactional setup in order to manage by exception um, and not create a lot of busy work for people to create uh, manu you know, transactions out there just to support whatever you're trying to achieve. <clears throat> So um, how does the process flow look in general? Um, sorry that it's a bit of a busy diagram, but it is a good way to comprehensively discuss um, all of the features that are embedded in the outsource manufacturing setup. Um, so a couple quick notes. Uh, there are in the system documentation a number of features and settings that you need to have um, enabled in order to allow for outsource manufacturing. Uh, for instance, advanced build materials must be utilized. Um, beyond that, in this particular demo, I'm gonna be using inbound shipments because a lot of clients that have similar requirements to this will be, um, that is not a requirement whatsoever. Um, but uh, it, it does give you a good use case for the entirety of, of this process flow. So let's start at the beginning. Um, 
one of the immediate um, issues that we saw um, with the, the, this process is that traditional planning mechanisms. So, for instance, if we kept um, a reorder point inventory of the finished good assembly that we're looking to create at some 3PL location, um, we're not going to get this outsourced PO generated natively from any demand and supply characteristics that exist in that suite right now. This may be on a roadmap, but if you go to the order items screen, there's no way to generate an outsource work order PO. Um, right now, it appears the only way to do it is manually or via customization with some sort of external demand management um, or order creation tool, like a demand caster. Um, so that is a limitation and, and be aware of it. However, if you are able to get this PO created um, and the reason that it is decoupled from the demand is because ultimately an outsourced manufacturing PO is a PO for a service item. It is not for the assembly itself. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into the demo a little bit further. Um, but it's what creates this behavior where I can't say I got, you know, demand for my assembly item, create a PO for the service item that's associated with it. That does not exist currently. You'd either have to customize that or again, leverage an external tool. Once you've got your PO for your outsource work order on a line by line basis, um, you will, and, and really on a sub-assembly by sub-assembly basis, you will generate work orders out of this PO, um, and that will happen in an automated way. Um, these will be associated to line items on the PO, and they will be scheduled for assembly at your contract manufacturer location. Um, the PO will also be to your contract manufacturer who will have a vendor record that specifies which location um, is their outsourced uh, location for work order processing. <clears throat> um, once these work orders are released, uh, inventory commitments will be created and or purchase orders will be created um, based on the bill of material for the, um, the goods that are represented. And so this presents essentially three different inventory management um, schemes that you can leverage uh, depending on the nature of your supply chain. If you have um, components or sub-assemblies that are a part of your final assembly bill of materials, you can, and they're supplied by your contract manufacturer, you can directly create POs out of this work order to your contract manufacturer for those goods or services. Um, and so that's why this top path that says, you know, I've created a work order and now I'm gonna directly create a purchase order, um, again, to the contract manufacturer to uh, deal with that demand. Um, one note, I left this um, line red because despite the fact that this is systematically created and linked to this work order, um, in terms of downstream processes, you need to, oops, uh, you need to manually receive this or have, you know, some other action. There's no automated uh, event that um, receives these purchase orders at the component level um, that are planned for your contract manufacturer. So even if you're, you have a one-to-one -one relationship with a work order and I assemble all of the quantity on this work order um, and uh, close it out, uh, I'm still potentially gonna have an open PO uh, related to the component uh, goods uh, if I haven't received it, uh, hence the, the red line. However, um, the other path is that you uh, tell your work order to simply draw down on stock inventory at your contract manufacturer's NetSuite location, um, in which case you can maintain regular planning um, setup, uh, just like any other inventory location, reorder point or time phase um, for any component goods, both that your contract manufacturer may supply or that third party uh, vendors may supply. Um, and so this um, setup is 
automates the creation of some downstream uh, transactions, but ultimately, certainly we would advise you to get in a process of planning most of your component inventory at the location um, and doing it in a more uh, consolidated way as opposed to sort of a lot by lot methodology where you're kicking off uh, orders based uh, directly on demand. However, um, once all of these transactions are created, um, the downstream process gets rather simplified. Um, I have highlighted in, in the case of this demo, two boxes green, this PO for outsourced uh, work orders and the inventory receipt for those POs. Uh, the reason I highlight them green is uh, they, they're sort of master transactions in this whole flow, which is to say that you can create this PO and then have cascades of downstream transactions created or informed by it. Um, the PO creates the work orders, the work orders commit inventory, and then your inventory planning can create your downstream uh, POs uh, in an automated fashion to, to manage your inventory levels here. Um, and then the next step of this is your shipment management. Um, in our demo, we're going to be using inbound uh, shipments. If you just do normal inventory receipts, that's fine as well, and it works the same way. But um, the real value of this um, feature is the use of the receipt to achieve multiple transaction um, uh, automation. So once I receive this outsource PO, several different activities occur that are uh, identified by, by these maroon uh, arrows. One, I'm going to receive um, the transaction, the, the PO for the, the service. And so the economic impacts of the conversion um, will be recognized at that time, and those costs will be expensed via that PO, which I can then um, execute payment on. We're going to build whatever assemblies we've received automatically. And so those assemblies will automatically be built and their uh, component inventory will be relieved uh, out of inventory um, if it's stock inventory. And then lastly, our built finished good assemblies, because recall this ultimately was a PO for a service, but it specified the assemblies that were going to be built on these work orders. That built assembly is going to be completed in this contract manufacturer's location. We're going to need it transferred into our ultimate um, destination location. In the, the case of this demo, it's, it's, I called it a 3PL. And so we've got a 3PL out there that, again, we had a shortage that kicked off the uh, purchase order in the first place. We're ultimately going to need to recognize that uh, inventory back here at the 3PL. And so what this gives organizations a chance to do is at a high level, they really just need to maintain a couple of different transaction flows to automate a lot of this back sort of uh, GL important and, and planning important transactions, but not necessarily something that you need to manually have to go through and, oh, okay, I'm gonna receive this and build this, and then I can solve this. It, it, it does it all for you and off of something like a shipment record that you could be managing in concert with a freight forwarder. Um, and, and so it does present a lot of uh, efficiencies there. Um, so in terms of this, the issues, um, there's no automated way to generate these POs. Um, so you're either going to have to customize or manually plan. Or, or enter the, the, the POs for the outsource manufacturing. And whenever we get into the system demo, I'll, I'll explain some of the differences between that and normal PO and why, you know, currently that is the case. Um, to the presence of the service item on the PO, uh, you can't apply net suite landed costs, both at the inbound shipment or just at a normal inventory receipt level. Um, because the assembly is ultimately transferred, there's no way to associate those costs uh, to it natively. It would require customization. Um, purchased components are not automatically received. That I discussed on the prior slide. Um, 
the purchase components must come from the contract manufacturer if you want lot for a lot performance, which is to say, if you are uh, purchasing items from a third party vendor and not your contract manufacturer, the outsource manufacturing natively will not create that purchase order in the work order at your contract manufacturer's location. Again, I'll, I'll call attention to that in the demo, but just know that um, if you want something purchased off of a bill of material on a outsource work order, it's got to be something that you're purchasing directly from your contract manufacturer. It cannot be a third party vendor. Uh, which forces you to take a more uh, comprehensive location level planning um, standpoint if you want to utilize this feature for now. Um, and then as well, uh, just as you know, inherent with any uh, newly released um, feature, it's, you know, there are going to be uh, snafus and, and issues as uh, the functionality is refined. And so, for instance, the documentation uh, for this feature referenced an assembly build helper I was we were unable to to get that to appear in any of our demo environments and we have some open support tickets, but no feedback right now. Um, I, you know, that's not to say anybody else would have the same issue, but it's a new feature. And so there's always going to be, you know, some growing pains associated with that. Um, the benefits are uh, clearly the diminished uh, transactional effort and the automation of transaction creation. Um, it, the, uh, it provides a route for a simplified uh, manner of uh, cost comparison, uh, especially if you've got multiple contract uh, manufacturers and scope uh, in your supply chain. Um, it has a, a better transactional um, flow for organizations specifically that have conversion costs um, that they're paying these contract manufacturers. Um, and it has uh, the benefit of providing a more uh, real world consistent uh, logistics management picture, especially if you take ownership of inventory overseas and need to transport it um, back to the US, you can do so on an inbound shipment um, associated to a purchase order as opposed to dealing with a transfer order, which would be the sort of native NetSuite way of, of managing. Um, your inventory assets and m movement between locations. Um, and so the last note on this before we hop into the demo is just to, to note that, you know, ultimately what outsource manufacturing represents fundamentally is a slight paradigm shift in terms of how outsource manufacturing POs work versus normal POs. Um, and so they're not natively created by planning tools yet. Um, and you need to have um, both vendors set up to be outsourced manufacturers, um, locations specific to those vendors um, that are inventory locations in your system that you will manage. Um, and you, you need to, to have these outsourced manufacturing either service or other charge items, um, which are sort of the hallmark of, of how they set up the system. Uh, and so with that, let's let's bump over into the the, the environment and, and sort of see this at work. And so after you've installed the feature, uh, you'll get the availability to work with outsourced purchase order forms. And the discrepancy here is really uh, lies on the item line. Um, and so at a high level, um, the vendor is the contract manufacturer. We've specified that they're an uh, outsourced manufacturer and we've specified to use a particular location, um, the contract manufacturer location. Uh, we're making this purchase order uh, from our 3PL uh, that's located in the United States. And in this case, we're saying we want uh, 15 of this particular assembly, uh, which is a solar fan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, however, if you look at this PO from the native NetSuite perspective, the item on the PO is actually this contractor services, which is a uh, other charge. It can be a service item or other charge that, uh, I, that I've set up and set this vendor as um, somebody that we can purchase this item from. This item is meant from NetSuite's perspective to accommodate the conversion cost. 
or essentially a fee that we pay this vendor for manufacturing this item for us. And so in this case, I've, I've set it to $50 and I've said we want a quantity of 15. So this particular purchase order is going to be for $750. And this purchase order is simply the amount that we are paying this vendor, vendor to convert inventory into 15 of these SAF uh, 100 items, these, these uh, solar power paneled, uh, sorry, so solar fans. Um, so a few other notes. Um, I'm telling the system what uh, bill of materials and revision to use. And again, this gives you a lot of flexibility um, if you have multiple bills, multiple vendors in scope. Um, I'm also uh, identifying a production start and end date. Uh, depending on how you interact with your vendors, you may want to convey uh, work orders to them, or you may only want them to see this purchase order. There's um, flexibility in, in how you transmit this, uh, of course, in your NetSuite setup in general, but natively, um, this is going to create uh, a work order that's associated with this assembly at our contract manufacturer using this bill of materials. And it's going to set the production start and end date uh, based on the, the line item setting. Um, that is going to occur once this purchase order has been saved in a pending receipt um, status. So I'm gonna go ahead and approve this thing and save it. And in doing so, uh, we will generate that associated work order. Now, um, at this stage, we've got an open PO against the vendor for a non-stock item, you know, another charge or a service item uh, for 15 units. And we have this assembly um, identified on the order. Um, and again, this is a PO that is uh, generated from our 3PL location, but is gonna be built in our contract manufacturer location. Now, subsequently what this has done is created uh, a work order. And again, it would be uh, multiple work orders uh, associated to every assembly line item. And this work order is going to have, uh, I, I, again, some of these, um, the same line item details, the production start date, Based on the bill of materials, it's going to define the um, component list for the assemblies. And in this case, uh, my bill of material had um, the, the following setup. For this particular hardware piece, um, we said this thing is going to be something that we purchase and we're going to purchase it directly from the contract manufacturer. And so in this case, um, we do have the ability on this work order to generate a purchase order out of it. However, um, in the case of the rest of this particular bill of materials, I've also told the system to purchase this electrical component. Unfortunately for us, or you know, uh, not, not unfortunately, but based on my setup, however, I've not specified the contract manufacturer as my preferred vendor. In fact, it's it's some third party vendor. Um, what this does is it disallows my work order from generating a purchase order for this particular component at the, um, the contract manufacturer location. So it's going to put a commitment against stock and make me plan for this particular component at that location as I would a normal inventory item. Uh, this solar plant panel, uh, I was always planning on uh, relieving from stock, so nothing changes here. Now, um, you can see none of this is committed because right now my work order is at a planned status. Um, I will go ahead and release this, and as soon as I do, um, I'm going to commit inventory uh, associated to the, the, the requirements of this order. And so from a planning perspective, um, and I'm gonna bump back into my slide deck, um, this provides us a benefit because 
as soon as we generate purchase orders and release the work orders, we're seeing component demand that we can plan for at our contract manufacturer's location. Um, and so because of the automation behind the scenes, we're getting very timely inventory commitment tracking um, systematically. All right, so back um, to the order at hand. Um, and I believe this was my, my purchase order. So at this stage, I've uh, generated my uh, work order. I released my work order. And in doing so, I generated a purchase order for uh, this item on the bill of material um, to the, uh, again, to the contract manufacturer where I'm, you know, creating my assemblies. Um, and so this purchase order, again, back to our, our deck, is not going to be um, managed by uh, the system. I will have to manage this independently and receive it, or somebody at my contract manufacturer would. Um, it will not be automatically received based on what happens downstream with the final inventory receipt, um, just to make sure that everybody is clear on that behavior. Um, but back here in the rest of uh, my, my setup, I, I now have this purchase order. I've got my work order. I've got my component inventory um, commitments. And, and so I'm ready to, to process. Now, in a lot of cases, um, for clients that are operating in these environments, what you end up getting um, is inbound shipment details. Um, when shipments are planned, um, whenever they're sent, and et cetera. And a lot of folks will be using uh, inbound shipments. And so this is not an inbound shipment demo, so I'm going to leave a lot, most of this uh, empty, but just sort of talk about the behavior on my outsource manufacturing setup um, as opposed to this, uh, the, the inbound shipment piece. Um, nonetheless, uh, recall I've got my PO 288, it's pending receipt, and it's for this contract uh, services. Again, that um, that's a service item. So I can specify this um, on my PO. Um, it knows that I've got a line item for these contractor services. And it's going to assume I want to receive the whole thing. But in this case, I'm going to tell it, you know, uh, no, this, this is simply just going to be um, a partial uh, receipt. And so without any other detail, I'm going to save this. It's going to generate a, a shipment record um, in NetSuite. And uh, back in my PO, it will tell me that for this um, Oh, and I apologize, I need to use a, a different form, but I would be able to see that if I had uh, the field revealed, and I apologize, I wanted to show this as a, um, a totally vanilla, but I, I did need to reveal this field in this particular form. Um, it'll show you that the, there's five uh, of these on uh, shipment, and you can click in here to, to see that detail if you so desire. Um, but back to our inbound shipments. Now we have this. Uh, we'll mark it in transits. Um, and, and a lot of times these will be things that uh, you've gotten integrated um, through your freight forwarders website or you know, just whatever methodology you're using. But you can manually manage them as well. Um, and so it does give you the opportunity to take ownership of uh, the, the, these assets. But it, in, in this case, there's not really an ownership play. This is not inventory that you're purchasing on this, um, this particular PO. So do be mindful of that uh, limitation. Um, but in this case, we're going to go ahead and receive um, the inventory. And recall again that in this case, we're only receiving uh, five uh, of an order of uh, 15. And so we'll, we'll mark it as received um, and it'll be processing there in the background. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save this uh, custom form with my PO. And uh, now we can see that my PO is uh, 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 pending uh, billing partially received. 
and we could go out there and we'll see an item receipt. Um, now this item receipt is against that service item. Um, and so again, maybe not what we're, uh, it's a piece of the puzzle, but not all of it. So this, this handles the charges that our, our uh, contracts uh, manufacturer um, charged us, but it doesn't handle the inventory. What's happened on the inventory uh, side is that now our work order is in process. We have five built. And again, I took no action to do this other than receive against that purchase order. Um, and I've got an assembly build um, associated to the receipt of, of that item out there again against this uh, work order. And in the background of the system as well, um, what happened is after that completion um, associated to that particular assembly item, uh, if I go and look at my related records, um, there is going to be uh, inventory transfer that is associated with uh, the movement of the good uh, O. Oh, <laughs> you know, I think I made a mistake whenever I processed uh, my inbound shipment. I am going to process one more. <laughs> Uh, because I missed a piece. I did not, I received it at my contract manufacturers. Uh, and so I do apologize. Um, shoot. Let's see if we can uh, go ahead and receive uh, some more. <laughs> Um, but uh, this time in the appropriate uh, location. So uh, this time I'm going to receive uh, 10, uh, but as opposed to receiving it at my contract manufacturers, this time I'm going to receive it where the PO was generated from my 3PL. Uh, and so I'm going to save that shipment um, and execute the same process over again, uh, mark it in transit, and then receive it. And again, uh, when I'm receiving it, I'm going to make sure that it's in the appropriate uh, location, save that receipt, and it will process. And eventually, um, once the, the processing is done uh, behind the scenes, um, it will move my purchase order into pending billing altogether. I will have my subsequent uh, fulfillment. And by virtue of my setting up the appropriate uh, inbound shipment status um, just to the appropriate location, um, the system will have not only automated um, the, the work order completion, so now we'll see that this work order is built, um, all quantities are built, and we've got assemblies uh, against you know, all of those quantities. But in addition, at the item, level itself, we will see um, a inventory transfer, which um, it, it will be one of these, I, I believe it will be in fact this one, um, that uh, occurred that moved it, um, the inventory from the contract manual. Here at GSI, we are a full service NetSuite implementation provider, meaning that we provide initial implementations, post implementation support, as well as post implementation project work. As well, we're happy to work with external third party providers. And in fact, we enjoy a lot of partnerships with applications that integrate well to NetSuite. If you ever have any interest in GSI services of, of any time in around your NetSuite instance, please feel free to visit us at getgsi.com slash netsuite slash services and either fill in the contact form or use the chat uh, screen at the bottom right corner. Uh, as well, you can review some of our more specialized project consulting services such as project recoveries or re-implementations, that type of thing. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it and we hope to hear from you soon.